Hello and good evening to all of you. A very, very warm welcome on behalf of the Srinivas Rai Prol Literary Trust and the Rai Prol family to each and every one of you. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Aparna Rai Prol, Srinivas Rai Prol's youngest daughter. We're really thrilled to be doing this event for the sixth time already. Can't believe that time has been flying like this. I would like to particularly welcome this evening our uh, special guest, Ranjit Hoskote, who is here, and uh, as well as Ranjani Murli, the winner. A big hand for both of them. I'd also like to welcome our jury members for this year, Professor Mohan Ramanan and Professor Sachidananda Mohanty on behalf of the English department. I'd also uh, like to welcome all the faculty as well as friends and guests from outside, media people and students. You know, without you all, this function would never take off. So without further ado, I want to also state that we're really not late. I just cheated a little bit on the program saying 6 o'clock. But 6 o'clock was supposed to be tea and chat, chai and chat. So because people keep streaming in, and now we have a fairly filled in auditorium, particularly since we are holding it on our campus. And you know, students being students will come in, stroll in. So I now would like to invite my sister, Professor Manurama Kanuri, to talk about Srinivas Rai Prol, as well as introduce the trust and the prize. Thank you. It is indeed my pleasure and honor to introduce my father, even though all the people present here know about him. I would just like to say a few things about him which some of you know and some of you may not know, which we have been repeating year after year, but then we have at least 50% of the audience every year who's new to this whole prize giving function. So I'd like to spend a few minutes. I beseech you to be patient. And we'll also go through the previous prize winners, a little bit of introduction to all the other five prize winners of the previous years after the introduction of my father. Basically, the Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize was launched in the year 2008, and the prize giving started from the year 2009. So we have six prizes given away until now. This was the beginning where Professor Sachidananda Mohanty and the trust, which consists of the family members, have signed a memorandum of understanding at the Hyderabad University English Department. And during uh, this, uh, basically, the Literary Trust was started in the year 2000 in the presence of my mother, who was there at that time to perpetuate the memory of my father and to continue the legacy of his poetry through young poets all over the world. My father was an also known as R.S. Martandam. I'll talk a little bit more about, come to that a little later. The Poetry Prize was instituted in 2008 after we signed the MOU. And this was given to poets who write in English between 20 and 40 years of age. And this is jointly administered by the Department of English and the Srinivas Rai Prol Trust. The beginning marked a very interesting um, launch where Jeet Tahil and Sridhala Swami recited poems. Jeet Tahil, Tahil had a very unique way of reciting his poetry. He was like a rock star. He had a guitar in his hand and he, was, uh, he imagined himself in a pub in New York. That's how he made us feel when he read out his poetry. Then the first poetry prize was given away in the year 2009 to Aditi Machado. The chief guest at that time was Professor Shiv K. Kumar. You all know about him. And the jury consisted of Sudeep Sain, Professor Mohan Ramanan, and Professor Sachidanand Mohanty. I think we have turned full circle as two of the jury members are again jury members for this year's prize. 
Aditi was 23 years old. She grew up in India. She currently lives in St. Louis, USA, where she is pursuing her MFA. Her literary work has appeared in publications such as The Guardian, Eclectica, A Capella Zoo, and Pratilipi. She also edits the poetry section of Asymptote, an international journal of translation. She won the Toto Funds. Arts Award for creating ra Creative Writing in the year 2009. The 2010 Poetry Prize was won by Hemant Mahapatra. The chief guest was K.K. Dharwala. The jury consisted of Jeet Tai Lagen, Professor Shailaja Pingali from the English Department and Professor Sachidanand Mohanty. Hemant was 29 years old. He is an engineer by profession, very similar to what my father was. He studied at IIT Mumbai and the University of Cincinnati, while my father had studied at Banaras Hindu University and Stanford University. With a childhood surrounded by the Himalayas and the Shivalik Ranges, he started with poetry at the age of 18. A winner of the Harper Collins India Poetry Prize for the year 2008-9, Mohapatra was also on the shortlist for the TFA Creative Writing Awards 2010. The 2011 prize was again won by another Aditi, Aditi Rao. The chief guest was Meena Alexander. This function was uh, merged with the Hyderabad Literary Festival and we had it at Taramati Baradri, a beautiful ambience. The jury consisted of Dr. K. Srilata, Professor Syed Mujibuddin and again Professor Sajidananda Mohanty. Aditi was 26 years old a writer, educator and activist and had spent the last eight years traveling between India, Argentina, Mexico and the United States. Currently she lives in Delhi where she works in the field of peace education. She, then she facilitates creative writing, workshops at the educational institutions and carves out time between her twin passions of poetry and pottery. She holds an MFA degree in creative writing from Sarah Lawrence College, New York. The 2012 prize was won by Tushar Jain. The chief guest was Hyderabad University's own Hoshang Merchant. The jury consisted of Arundhati Subramanian, Professor M. Sridhar and Professor Pramod Nair. Tushar was 26 years old, a Delhi-based writer, pursuing his master's in English and economics. Poetry and writing remained his passion. Publishing since he was 16, he has, his work has appeared in small press magazines like Black Petals to literary journals like Hastakar. Currently, he is working on a novel and also a play. Last year's prize was won by Mihir Vatsa, the chief guest was the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Hyderabad University, Professor Ram Ramaswamy, and the jury consisted of Manohar Shetty, Professor Narayan Chandran, and Sindhu Menon. Mihir was 22 years old, a postgraduate student of English at Delhi University. His poems have appeared in Island Review, Eclectica Magazine, Contemporary Literary Review of India, the Four Quarters Magazine, and the Boston Literary Magazine, among other places, among other journals. He works with the NGO called Green Brigade. These are all the people who have been visiting the Poetry Prizes. Now, a few words about my father before I hand over the proceedings of the prize giving function. Ironically, Srinivas Rai Prol was not a poet by profession. Most people knew him as R.S. Martandam, a very strict and upright engineer who worked for the Andhra Pradesh government. He rose to the highest of ranks in the government, implementing project after project in an exemplary manner. The precision and technical brilliance with which he executed even the most mundane of projects won him many accolades and a very high reputation in the government. This man was a totally different person when he wore his other mantle of a poet. As the second son of the great Telugu poet, and the father of modern Telugu literature, Sri Raya Prolu Subbarao, he, he inherited his strict, almost bordering on the patriarchal personality from his father. The poet in him came alive in his younger days, when he grew up in Sikandrabad, 
wandering in the lanes and by lanes of West Marit Pali, along with the closest and closest of friends, most of whom have gone along with him. He was much more mellow, more inward and introspective, more of a dreamer, and his creative juices flowed while he was writing poetry. While studying engineering at Banaras Hindu University, he was at his best, sitting on the banks of the river Ganges. He wrote many a poem. Again, while pursuing his master's at Stanford University in structural engineering, very far from poetry, he mastered the art of creating and combining words into poetry. After his retirement again, he resumed his writings and gave some of his best works. His association with William Carlos Williams and the influence he had on the writings, on his writings is now well known. The letters between them, thanks to my sister Aparna, are now part of a collection of the works of the American poet. His works included, very few I must say, Bones and Distances, Married Love and Other Poems, Selected Poems, as well as several anthologies in which his work was, in which his work figured. He even edited a collection of journals called East and West, which included several poems of poets like him. Even though he published very few books, he came to be known as one of the significant personalities of early Indian English poetry. These are his fa family members. He married the great-granddaughter of Dr. Bhogarazu Pattabhisita Ramaya, one of the stalwart politicians involved in the freedom movement from Andhra. Letters exchanged between them were also of significance because of the unique flow of words between the grand son-in-law and the grand historian. He had three daughters, the eldest of whom was Anuradha, our eldest sister, who also inherited his writing abilities and is unfortunately no more. We miss her and both my parents, especially so, when we meet here year after year to celebrate my father's wonderful poetry. I am the second daughter, Manurama and Aparna Raipron, along with her husband, Dr. Vinod Pavarala, is instrumental in execu executing the poetry prize every year. She is the third daughter. The onus now lies with both of us, our spouses, along with my sister's daughters, Alankrita, Alekia, Sharanya, and the little one, Nishka, who is only three years old, to carry forward his legacy. We are very happy that all the youngsters who are getting the prizes year after year are helping us in carry forward this legacy. I now hand over the proceedings to my sister, Aparna. Thank you. I know for some of you, it is um, something that you know, but for many others, as Manu said, it was new. Uh, may I now invite the head of the Department of English, Dr. Murali Manohar, to welcome you on the behalf of the department, please. Good evening, friends. On behalf of faculty, office staff, students, and research scholars of Department of English, I would like to welcome you all who have come from far and distant places, especially you can see the winner has come from the US. You know, uh, of course, the winner uh, has been, the, uh, but there are many people who have come from far places and I welcome you all. And uh, this is my uh, second you know, uh, time that I am participating you know, on behalf of the department, as head of the department. Uh, previous uh, year I was not here, but I am very happy that I am again associating with the Srinivas Raipur Literary Trust uh, in collaboration with our department. Uh, the department uh, was established in 1974 since inception, and there have been uh, distinguished professors who have served in this department, uh, very well reputed professors in this field. And uh, I know I don't want to name, but there are uh, there is a long list to name. But uh, you know to mention a few like uh, Professor 
एस नागराजन प्रोफेसर शिव के शिव के कुमार चिरंतरन कुलश्रेष्ठ सुधाकर मराठे एंड अदर्स दे हैव ऑल कंट्रीब्यूटेड एंड बिल्ड दिस डिपार्टमेंट एंड हैज रिपुटेशन द कंट्री एंड वेन कम कमिंग टू दी डिपार्टमेंट एज सच वी ऑफर प्रोग्राम सच एज एम एम फिल एंड पी एच डी विथ इंटेक ऑफ फोर्टी फाइव टेन एंड एट रेस्पेक्टिवली वी आर सपोज टू बी सेवेंटीन फैकल्टी मेम्बर्स एंड द डिपार्टमेंट दैट इज द सेंक्शन पोजिशन बट द सिचुएशन ऑफ दिस डिपार्टमेंट नाउ इज ओनली विथ टेन फैकल्टी मेम्बर्स एंड देर आर सेवन वैकेंसीज दैट वी हैव बीन वीटिंग द यूनिवर्सिटी टू फिल फर्स्ट एडवर्टाइज दैन फिल वी ऑल्सो हैव स्पेशल असिस्टेंस प्रोग्राम uh from the ugc and this is going to be uh this is coming to an end by march 2015 and we'll have to seek for center for advanced study uh in the uh, dsa program we had uh, 67 lakhs as the grant with which we have been you know uh, researching uh, you know and contributing to this you know field of literary studies and the thrust area of this dsc is english in india and uh, the department also runs the library with with books uh, purely donated by various people and one of the um, you know members is that sinwas raipur the literary you know trust you know actually they have contributed a lot to this department of library and followed by various other you know uh, people like uh, sirensen kulshreshta sudhakar marate murli chenduri and we also have some um, you know endowment fund out of which the whatever the interest that we get every year we buy books and you know add to our collection and we also have multimedia laboratory which is uh, not very much functional because some of the faculty members who have been researching on language studies have moved out from our department and uh, of course we we still hold on to that and uh, i i take this opportunity to congratulate as head of the department because um, i had to nominate two of the jury members from department of english and as you can see uh, professor sachidanand mohanty has been instrumental in having this memorandum uh, mou and he has been there most of the time as the one of the jury members and he deserves that credit and i congratulate ms ranjani morali for getting this year's prize and uh, i also thank both professor mohan ji ramnan and professor sachidanand mohanty who have immediately agreed to be jury members and uh, along with them we, from the trust side we have ranjit haskote as jury member and as far as poetry in general is concerned that there has been this comment that who is reading poetry these days at least language departments such as english telugu hindi urdu you know uh, teach poetry and encourage students to write poetry indirectly generally reading habit itself has been declining reading poetry is hardly seen let us not talk about researching on poetry on the contrary my first research degree was on poetry the poetess was kamla das while reading her poetry at the age of 22 raised so many questions in my mind why is she so open in her views which no poet woman poet would dare ask my research topic was found while doing my ma fourth semester itself when there was a debate whether one should write in english or in regional language and there was also this question that 
whether indian english poetry was worth reading whether indian poets were good enough to write poetry you know this was the debate that was going on when the course called indian writing in english was being offered in fact indian writing in english itself was questioned but in today's context no department runs without this course called indian writing in english and coming back to kamala das's uh, you know poetry you know she tackles and answers to those questions in her poem entitled an introduction i quote i do not know politics but i know the names of those in power and repeat them like days of week or names of months beginning with nehru i am indian very brown born in malabar i speak three languages write in two dream in one don't write in english they said english is not your mother tongue why not leave me alone critics friends visiting cousins every one of you why not let me speak in any language i like the language i speak becomes mine mine alone it's half english half indian funny perhaps but it is honest it is as human as i am human don't you see it voices my joys my longings my hopes and it is useful to me as cawing is to crows or roaring to the lions it is human speech the speech of the mind that is here and not there a mind that sees and hears and is aware not the deaf blind speech of trees in storm or of monsoon clouds or of rain or the incoherent mutterings of the blazing funeral pyre and coat thank you thank you very much murli uh, we are indeed very honored to have ranjit hoskote among us today and i am extremely grateful to ranjit for immediately agreeing to actually be on the jury and mark his calendar way way ahead and be with us i now invite ranjit hoskote to the dais srinivas rai prol's daughter granddaughter saranya and great granddaughter nishka are coming to welcome ranjit hoskote Wait. This time, I must say thanks to the winner of the evening. Before I invert, invite her onto the dais. She flew halfway around the world with a little toddler in tow for this occasion and made it extra special for us. And I want all of you to know that she had less than three weeks to make this trip. I invite Ranjini Murli onto the dais. The great granddaughter is going to welcome you, Ranjini. You're used to little children, so a big hand, yes. <laughs> I now invite one of our jury, other jury members, Professor Mohan Ramanan, onto the dais to say a few words about the process of jury. friends it has been a pleasure and an honor to work closely with ranjit hoskote and sachidanand mohanty in determining who should get the rai prol prize for 2014 i thank the rai prol family for reposing their trust in us my colleagues in the jury will no doubt agree with me when i say that the overall quality of the submissions this year was of a high standard and that when it came to our final decision it was not taken lightly and indeed taken after nearly a week of intense consultation I want to acknowledge 
the collegial spirit in which Ranjit and Sachi worked with me and their graceful give and take of argument. Finally, all of us agreed that Ranjini Murali was a clear winner. <laughs> Poems, generally speaking, broadly, are of two kinds. And certainly that was my experience with the 350 to 400 odd poems from over 150 participants which came to us as samples. One kind of poem has imagistic density but no paraphrasable uh, permanent core of content. The other kind are ejaculations from the heart syrupy and sentimental with little in the way of concrete apprehension of ideas and feeling. We rejected both kinds of poems. Sifting through these submissions, we set aside poems which did not make clear sense or were obscure in one way or another, or were merely wordy with more adjectival excess and less verbal energy. Poems with ungrammatical formulations and images which evoked improbable ideas were also rejected. We focused on poems which combined the specificity of the image with a narrative line where image and concept were happily married and where we could reasonably say that here was a poet who had thought long and deeply on her subject and found the right words to articulate that thought. We narrowed down our search to four poets and after much thought chose Ranjani Murali. What I particularly liked in her poems was the careful choice of words and the apt handling of syntax. Her poems are both things said and things made, both communique and artifact. I hope you will applaud our choice when she reads from her poems, but I cannot resist the temptation to do so myself, and I'm going to read a poem which was submitted to us called Foretell. Foretell. Yes, the parrot in the cage is mine, but he reads fortunes. On rainy days, he flicks his head toward the anthill on the side of this tree. Famous men come to see him. The director, who recently celebrated the 100th day jubilee. The local minister, the mayor, and even the child star, who likes to play with cheetah cubs in his spare time. The smell of feline hair on him sends the bird into a tizzy. He claws at my knuckles and then draws always the tarot card with the goddess riding a lion, as if he has felt the tearing of a claw under his silken neck, the sound of a cat licking itself before the blood comes, the instant when the cage snaps shut and the predator, leashed and delirious, is foaming at the mouth, standing outside, waiting to hear his fortune. I warmly congratulate Ranjani on winning this prestigious prize for raising the bar, so to speak, and wish her a very bright poetic future.
The other three finalists, if I may call them that, whose names I cannot reveal, deserve our warm appreciation as well, because they too have demonstrated great poetic prowess. On the whole, if this particular experience is any criterion, I believe Indian poetry in English is in good and safe hands, and with such poets, does have a promising future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Ramanan has been a major source of support for the Trust, and we have been consulting him right from the beginning, has been very patient with us. Um, now, I am going to invite, Ranjit is already here, but he's going to give away the prize. It is the moment of the evening. And uh, Ranjit is actually going to give away the prize to Ranjani, and then we will I would like to formally introduce Ranjani Murali. <coughs> Ranjani Murali is a poet and an educator, currently living in Chicago in the United States, and is the proud winner of the sixth Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize. I thought I should say has been awarded already and not is going to be. So um, she has been chosen from a field as Professor Ramanan told us 175 contents, contestants by a jury who you have all met already and Ranjit has just given away the award to her. Ranjani received her MFA in poetry from George Mason University in Virginia where she taught creative writing workshops and introductory writing courses. In 2011, she received the Vermont Studios Center's K. Evans Poetry Fellowship and a non-fiction fellowship from the Fine Arts Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Her poetry, non-fiction, and translations have appeared in the Nth Position, Cura, Cricket Online Review, Phoebe, Karthik Review, and elsewhere. Her collaborative poetry projects were exhibited at George Mason University's Fall for the Book Festival, both in 2010 and 2012. And now she's currently working on her first book-length poetry collection, and I'm sure little Bhargav will delay that a little more <laughs> too. <laughs> I also want to say something that no one knows here, not even Ranjani. She was also in the jury's list of 2013 for the Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize, because there are several entries. We did not reveal all those names at that point of time. So thank you, Ranjani, you know, having faith in that and coming and, you know, coming all the way to receive it. Vinod and I were talking about having the award on Skype with Ranjit, giving it away electronically or something. Um, I'm now going to actually read the citation that our jury members have so carefully and wonderfully worded. <laughs> so the Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize was presented on October 18th to Ranjani Murali for poetry that demonstrates an economy and elegance indicating reserves of effect with minimal yet telling gestures for precision of phrasing, sharpness of image and a command over tonality, qualities that make hers a distinctive voice from which one would expect substantial achievement in the future. I now invite the sixth Srinivas Rai Prol Poetry Prize winner, Ranjani Murali, to please read to us. Oh. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Before I read, uh, I will extend a formal, uh, somewhat Grammy-like uh, uh, official thank you to everybody involved in this process uh, for putting up with me, for putting, particularly for putting up with my toddler, too. 
Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Srinivas Raipur Trust for uh, this wonderful honor. Uh, somebody just asked me in the morning what happened when I heard about the prize. I was actually at the park with my toddler and he was on the swing and I don't know who went higher, whether he did or whether I did because I was just instantly jumping up. Uh, I think people around me might have possibly been a little bit scared. Uh, so <laughs> after that I, uh, I reached out to ma'am and I am absolutely floored uh, by the warmth, by the affection, and by the trust that has been reposed in me by this, thank you, by this uh, wonderful group of people um, who are all family of uh, uh, Srinivas Raipur. And um, I particularly want to thank Aparna ma'am and Vinod sir and uh, Manorama ma'am for helping uh, me get here and for supporting me. Uh, because traveling was not easy, definitely, uh, with him. But this was an honor worth receiving in person. Uh, and I want to thank the jury members, as I said, for reposing this kind of um, faith in my uh, ability, in my capability to move, possibly move, uh, to affect some kind of catharsis, to uh, uh, possibly even annoy people with my poetry. And I always maintain that poetry has the ability to uh, uh, evoke strong emotions. It's kind of like running a marathon. It's kind of like watching a marathon. You know, you're sort of just sitting at the edge of your seat. Sometimes you're annoyed. Sometimes you're ecstatic, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I want to thank all the people at the university who my, made my stay absolutely wonderful. I, I feel somewhat like royalty. <laughs> I think I'm going to miss this tomorrow when I wake up and I realize that it's uh, a new day and I have to write a new poem or possibly revise the same poem for the 50th time. And um, I also want to thank, uh, uh, particularly thank uh, Ranjit Koskote, uh, Professor Sachitanda Murthy, and Professor uh, Mohanty, and Professor uh, Ramanan, uh, particularly to Ranjit Koskote, someone who I've been reading since I was 16 or 17, possibly before I started writing anything worthwhile, uh, and somebody who inspired in me a love for translation, which is central to my work as a poet, uh, and who introduced me also to uh, the Hindu literary review. And I, I've been reading your work for a long time. And uh, in some ways, uh, somebody who introduced me to Arun Kolatkar as well, a poet that I just love. Um, and so I want to thank all these people. Um, I want to thank my family, uh, my husband who's not here, my toddler who has instilled in me a certain sense of urgency to go ahead and uh, revise work, it, a certain urgency which was not present earlier. And of course you, the audience, uh, all of you for being here for, uh, again, as I said, having faith in my ability to possibly move you in some one way or another. So without further ado, I'll just get right into the poems. So. Uh, Professor Ramanan gave a wonderful reading of uh, my poem, so I will not repeat it because I felt that it was done more than enough justice to. So I will go ahead and read the other two poems that were the uh, entries for this prize. Audio tour at Alcatraz prison. At the control room, the narrator enunciates, the telephone operators shuffle paperweights around, unaware of uprising. I pause to pick one up, a dusty, fluid-filled glass glob, an instrument of everydayness. The click-clack of a jailer's shoes resounds in my <coughs> earphones. Nearby, a couple walk into jail cells with no windows and walk out with their noses covered while their eyes whisper alone, solitary, violent behavior, in congruence with the narrator. In my recording, the thwack of a metal rod splitting a head bolsters the story. The one prisoner ever to escape successfully has flown. The control operator announces a lockdown. A siren sears my ears. I pull off the headphones and listen to the bass ripping concrete girders where a recreation center once stood. A girl whose nose reminds me of a minor flank rests on her father's shoulders 
fogging the scratched glass panes of a door nearby, drawing letters. Were this a home, I would have drawn into the water with my toes, clenching a calumet full of bird seed for pigeons, but the songs of these other Indians who marked this land with their hands is not on my lips. Instead, I imagine overhead jets spraying the tricolor and the navy streaming liners wafting flags. Ceremonial white doves are released in my reverie, but when I clap my hands into the cracked bay floor, a seagull sirens for food, another plea for escape. The bite of the winter currents and the warning of Pacific krill feeding shoals of salmon is too real for me. I strain to see the doves take off elsewhere into a swarm of mangroves, perhaps where I basked once, a teen covered knee-high in mud and mosquito bites, watching for planes overhead and the hint of rain, miners pirouetting around fruit those paperweights that pinned the colony of birds into the marsh, those escapes from the smell of salt, from speeches blaring on a black and white TV about freedom and failed crops that warranted no sirens, no grilled rooms full of telephones, windowless walls, no earphones to play the same story over and over of release from the sound of gull and the hunger for sky. And this is the third poem um, that went into the entry. Uh, I must mention here that the first poem, just in case there are some of you out here who are applying to poetry prizes, um, such as this one and others, this poem uh, was part of my entry last year. and. Uh, this is a revision, so I feel like this is in some ways a reinforcement of hope for the kind of uh, absolutely tedious revision process uh, that sometimes we subject our work to and subject ourselves to. So this is the next poem. Prostitutes Nocturne. And this has an epigraph. If you're going to come to Bombay, come at the bottom. And this is from Suketu Mehta's Maximum City. The blue plastic sheet on the auto rickshaw is flapping as your voice wavers. There is a rain here, our own, I often say invitingly. Let's call it this clouding. Watch this road, a circular brushing of bay, the, the pavement a blur of dust and rocks cut against the grey colonial facades the leaping lions. My arms are visible, but you will not circle my palm, city lover, or touch the damp denim, the stray thread, my clocked lips. Glassing of sea, of press clubs, of marine drive kerosene lamps, my names are written and written over granite, sunk in cobbles, street squares. Flinch my temple, pluck the sound of Honey, come, come, and double rate for octo, okay? From my throaty syllables, my rust grasping fingers. I chased a blink of leaning bodies on the train this afternoon, where the light turned, packed between our hips, into mirror shards, my reflections strewn on pink nails, clicking sandals. Your eye reaches for my holding of breath, of these meteoric, flashing seascapes, this cramping of skin, and I must throw my head out the strundling drone, lest my light scatters, seeping from between our reflections on the rear view, punctuating this clouding. Uh, this is uh, another po poem that's uh, loosely tied with the previous one. Uh, I'm an avid watcher, viewer of cinema, and I'm an avid viewer of cinema that is uh, pedestrian, kitschy. I love the. Uh, I love cinema that loves to annoy you. I love cinema that <laughs> that is uh, so stereotypical that it makes your blood boil. All those things. I, I love watching uh, those kinds of tropes and those kinds of 
ideas and themes that uh, are completely in some ways regressive because they make me think about uh, the images that are used to further regressive ideas, uh, regressive political, regressive social ideas. And uh, uh, this next poem, uh, I had it published in a journal and it won uh, a prize. And uh, I failed to mention this in the introduction, which is that if you've watched a Tamil movie called Agni Nakshatram, uh, there is uh, a scene where the hero, one of the heroes is uh, romancing this, uh, his heroine and uh, the she doesn't have she doesn't have a mother and he uh, is a bastard child and uh, it seems really interesting because uh, they're sitting at a, at a cafe and uh, he's calling out to her father uh, something that keeps happening in maniratnam films if you've observed you know he uh, not uh, maniratnam movies sorry balachandran movies uh, and money the movies. Uh, he keeps calling out to her father, and she says, "No, don't, don't do that." And he says, "Why? What's the problem?" And she says, "That's my stepfather." And she says it just like in such a whisper, "He's my stepfather. Don't do it." So, and and he says later on, you know, so what? I'm I'm a bastard child myself. And something about this unnecessary stigma. I mean, it, in our minds, it's not even sometimes it's not even a stigma, but that prompted a poem and uh, these are often how I um, come up with poems, this fossilized idea of uh, you know, uh, India as it were in the 80s or the 90s that's presented through these movies and all these uh, things that seemed so progressive at that time. Uh, I, I love to look back and think about these things. So this, this poem is called Flashback Sonnet, B Film Actress Seeks Lost Bastard Child. You were conceived on a beach with flare lamps, fanfare, rubber horns, bus halt screech, the hero with a penchant for number plate watching, salt rock, stiff nods from directors wiping necks with blue checked handkerchiefs, disco ball shard light dancing off Hayward's 5000, Sambrani plumes from nearby balconies, the clamor of Sundal boys, psycho bells and aluminum cans, and even a hunched man taking notes on suitable body angles. Start roll camera were not, was not a cue for extending bare knee. It was a precise rupturing of polished prism by an eye of light flecked with raw silica. Crystals wrenched from sheerness coating the love scene with an opacity that your fetal, forming eyes could never have known. You a springing of cinematic effusions and silicate songs in the rain, perhaps now bridge layer, cement mixer, glass carver, perhaps master of straight edges or crenel, or maybe just a construction worker passing by water, seeing through sand as my skin did that day an observation of pure refraction, gaze in glass. Chapel. In the mornings, tea steams over a prayer mantle stocked with brass trays containing marigold, fruit, and ash. As I strike the match, the lamp swills. Frames full of satiated, satiated godheads fog up. Even schoolgirls learn to marry tea and prayer. In the ocean-bound city where I lived earlier, hemmed in by its artificial seaport, the crosswind would have blown out the glow. But here, in the rust-rimmed inland plain, ambushed by waterfall, mountain light, and Malabar thrushes, flickering is a virtue. The flame, a shadow, a contorted ellipse, follows me to school, where I stare at the lime-green walls, the adhering of chalk, in striped wounds across coils of choir chairs. The steel cupboards simmer in lunch light, ponderous with notebooks and ink bottles. In a single file, we are led by a whimpering generator to where a musty room, evocative of three old, three week old, half opened bread, winces to life. Silent night, the nun in the beige sari croaks. We follow notes lodged in each other's self-assured eye movements, pausing to eke out a melody that the persistence of stale mouths emanates. The flame on my pinafore has forsaken the cupboards, heating the shingles on the roof, perhaps, depositing a steady line of steam prints on the black keys of the piano. 
I turn my face to an altar with pews strewn in front, taught in their suggestion of kneeling, themselves genuflected at 40 degree angles. I readjust my belt, read the notes of the back of the nun's shoulders, two muscles working as of grass shears, hacking their own blades off, heaping the swift hot air back into the urgency that has descended upon our throats, coping to take in this new turn, a bridge. I recall a geography lesson from my previous school on Cape Comorin where a giant rock impales the seabed. A man of penance swam there once, or perhaps tried. The tale remains incomplete. I went there once, stood in a line behind a man mumbling, rich people don't know summer or lines, as a gaggle of uniformed girls bypassed him. Inside, in a room full of the white fire of salt-heavy offshore gusts, I repeated, Dear Saint, I hope my next school is named after you too. No bridge was ever built due to the tide, the lesson maintained. The choppy ferry took us back, dry. The shears snap shut with the piano now and someone passes a mango drink. We are free to stroke the bridges of moth-eaten violence and saunter to the crucifix at the far end where the flame lingers, squatting on candlewick having accumulated roomfuls of dry-mouthed schoolgirls, wind instruments full of rust and spit, and 33,000 and two heads, horse, tortoise, fish, steam-faced, split-shanked, virgin-fleshed. How must it congeal, I wonder, and how, if any respite from water, would ever be sufficient to feed its one mouth? Thank you so much once again, everybody, for coming out here, for giving me this honor, for uh, listening to my poems, and to participate in uh, what can only be an ongoing uh, discussion and uh, deliberation on poetry uh, or Indian poetry in English. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ranjani. It was indeed mellifluous. Um, I think the time has come for me to request Professor Sachidananda Mohanty to please come on to the dais and introduce, of course, many people in this audience don't need an introduction, but we do our formalities. Uh, he will talk a little bit about our poet for the evening, Ranjit Hoskotik. <laughs> Good evening, Professor Aparna Raiprol and the family members of the Raiprol Trust, the head of the Department of English, Dr. Murili Manohar, the jury member, Professor Mohanri Ramanan, my colleague from the Department of English, Professor Pramod Nair, the chief guest and the chief of the jury, Ranjit Haskote, in whose honor partly we have gathered, along with the recipient of the 2014's Srinivas Raipral Poetry, Ranjini Morali, who has flown in from the United States, as an acknowledgement to the importance which is given to this trust. A grateful family is homage to the memory of a talented father. The person who was th the editor of the journal called East West that disseminated and was instrumental for some of the best poetry of his own times. Somebody who was a close colleague of William Carlos Williams. The effort by this family and the response by an institution that has been the genesis of this wonderful program. It is a truism that in our country we begin things very well, but we are unable to sustain it, more so in the case of poetry. Reference was made to my role, generously, about the conception and the continuation of this. Individuals are insignificant, inconsequential in the flow of time. 
we play our role and move on. I'd like to acknowledge the role of all the heads of the department after me who have nourished it with love and sustained it. Without the coming together of the department and the trust, such an activity will not continue. And therefore, I would like to take a back seat and say my role has been minimal. In a year's time, Professor Pramod Nair will take over. Our role is to play the, what is expected of us and in the manner of a relay race, pass on the baton to the new generation. By the end of this year, Professor Ramanan will be stepping down. In four to five years' time, I will not be here. What is important is to preserve and perpetuate these wonderful traditions for which institutions are known. I think it is in that spirit that we have gathered here. And I dare say that in this university, which is a premier one, which really holds a practically every day programs of exceptional kind, a program of this kind, to my mind, is a singular one, which is stellar. And you would notice that from the beginning till the end, not only in this program, but in the previous ones, things have been done very professionally. You just saw the way my colleague, the jury member, Professor Ramanan, summed up our own experience itself. So, at the risk of using an adage, shall I say, we in the English department, of English department, we believe in doing things professionally and doing things in style. That's very important. Style is as much imp as important as the substance. I will not depart from the text because it is a ceremonial occasion and I will stick to the protocol and what is expected of me. Ranjit Hoskote, who is already known to the university audience by the exceptional talk that he gave, and I sent him an SMS, it's a phenomenal, the way you covered disciplines yesterday when you got, talked about the craft of writing, the art and craft. And today he is in another avatar to read some of his poems, and I will request Ranjit at least five minutes of prefatory remark about poetry itself, so that the whole thing. We try to, you know, value-added things. We like to get mileage of the presence of the people. Today, I in we invited Ranjit to interact with our students. Communication department invited us to record her conversation. So we get mileage of the presence. Money's worth in today's global context. Makes sense, poetry also serving that kind of a role. Ranjit Hoskate is a poet, cultural theorist, and curator. He is the author of more than 25 books, ranging across poetry, art criticism, cultural history, and poetry in translation. He has many collections of poetry, Central Time, Penguin, Vanishing Acts, Penguin, some of the best known publishing houses. Not a rare thing, not a small thing. He's written or edited numerous artist book monographs and most recently, Atul Dadia. And then he has also curated many poetry, many uh, performing poetry uh, events. He's been a fellow of the International Writing Program, University of Iowa, and he was also the, the recipient of Muse India Translation Award. And I happened to be coincidentally one of the jury members, and that was about Lal Det, the Kashmiri poet. And what a beautiful introduction he gave. He would really put to shame many of the academics, the manner in which, for example, he crossed disciplinary terrain and forged connections in an unexpected manner that only a poet can do. That's exhibitions elsewhere and in major world capitals. And most recently, ladies and gentlemen, he has been shortlisted for the prestigious Kushman Singh Award. Ladies and gentlemen. We have great pleasure in welcoming Ranjit Hoskwati to our midst. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words of welcome, uh, Professor Mohanty. And uh, before I go on, I do want to say that it was really a marvelous uh, experience and collegiality for me as well to work with Professor Ramanan and Professor Mohanty on during this competition. And uh, let me congratulate Ranjani Murali on being the laureate of this year's uh, uh, competition. And uh, also let me say how extraordinarily moving this occasion is because it marks the commitment of a poet's family to his work and to his legacy. And also the commitment of an institution of higher learning 
to honor what is not strictly academic work, but work that lies at the source of much academic work, the word itself, the poet's word. So I'd like, in that spirit, to express my great appreciation of uh, the Srinivas Rai Pro uh, Literary Foundation, as well as uh, the University of Hyderabad's um, Department of English. And thank you all for being here this evening. I'll read from Central Time, the new book of poems. I'll begin with a poem called Platform Directions, which is uh, set in a museum in Berlin, which is called the Hamburger Bahnhof. It began life as a train station, but has long ceased to be, to play that particular role anyway. Platform Directions. Here's how you solve the riddles this train station poses when you come in from the sun, wristwatch stopped, looking for shade under cool timetables. Start by walking around, stare at a pyramid you cannot enter, look through an igloo made of glass and numbers, or test the runway laid out for a plane that could never take off. It taxis around a circle of broken stones. Now try the ramp that leads to a library of lead books, their pages stapled down, and a strong lens provided to blur the missing author's words. Someone's marked their favorite passages with dried puppy seeds. You're pulling on your coat, hefting your rucksack, but where's the rush, my friend? Have a cappuccino while you wait. You can take your time at the station. No train stops here. No train ever leaves. Now to another form of legacy. And partly this, has, this next poem is called To the Sanskrit Poets. It has to do partly with my sense of being a practitioner of a very particular kind of uh, poem, if you will. Many of us today work with the lyric poet, poem the fragmentary poem, the Khandakavya, if you will. But we rely, many of us, on memories that take in vast remembrances of epic, of narratives that stretch in time, space, and textuality. So one of my interests has always been to try and evoke something of that epic inheritance in the forms, the admittedly abbreviated forms that some of us choose to work in, to the Sanskrit poets. Leave something behind, a trace of cloud on a plate, a pair of white birds shot by a hunter, an emerald brooch that a shrub snatched from a princess in flight, or the archer's last prayer spoken minutes before his brother's arrow found his throat. Leave us these threads to unravel, embroider, secret messages inked in white on white beneath the unsettled weeks of postcards and air letters that jam the mailbox while we're away leave us the jigsaw of previous lives and this one's called giant malabar squirrel i noted what was it the malabar thrush in one of your poems so this was actually this poem actually started up for me during a during a visit to Sri Lanka uh, more than ten years ago. It was during a very brief ceasefire between the contending forces, and it was a very peculiar experience to be in a part of the subcontinent which seemed familiar in some senses, but was also estranged and estranging in others. And there was all of that to negotiate. And then there was this. Uh, incredible apparition of an animal I'd never seen before, hence giant Malabar squirrel, Anuradhapura. Large and motionless as a jackfruit about to fall, he hung off the banyan for minutes, head pointing earthward, unmindful of gravity and the body's natural justice. Brush-tailed ambassador of the higher branches, his back unblessed by the triple stripe of Rama's grateful fingers, his stare a declaration of war. 
He ignored the shelled nuts and coconut flesh that we held out, waited for us to back off, climb back on the bus that had brought us there. Through our tinted windows we saw him blur down the bark and spring, forepaws gripping the earth, nostrils dilated for hostile smells. Behind his bristling tail the stupa rose, chalk white, ripe in the center of our eyes, blinding at noon. Skipping to another part of the book and another set of concerns. This is called the calligrapher's bequest. And again, it has to do with an experience of viewing an extremely beautiful piece of art in, uh, in the context of a collection that came from the Aga Khan's treasures. And uh, this led me to think about what happens to artworks, what happens to words, and what happens to the things we cherish. The calligrapher's bequest. All green has gone from the broad chestnut leaf pinned behind glass. A fan of dried veins with the name of God brushed across it in swirling currents of gold. One of a thousand hopes, all thousand mixed in each. My shadow falls across these dancing strokes and evaporates. The slant afternoon light is raining through the barred panes, through the eclipse of my body on this dead leaf that carries the most beautiful word. This poem that I'm going to read is called Reading the Script at Ziyarat Dastgir Shobun. And it has, it has an inscription for time, Srinagar 2005. When I've read this poem before, I've had to explain that uh, Ziyarat Dastgir is one of the most, I used to say, is one of the most beautiful Sufi shrines in the, in the valley. But unfortunately, it burned down a few years ago. And now, with, as some of you are doubtless aware, with the floods that have overtaken the valley, uh, this sense, this narrative of ruin and desolation seems to gather a certain heaviness. So it's in that context that I think back to the, this poem was written when, when the Ziyarat was still very much in existence. But there is something in it which seems to, I don't want to claim any prescience at all, and certainly not in such a tragic situation. But there's a sense in which this melancholy enters, uh, enters this experience of being there. Uh, reading a script at Ziyarat Dastgir Soban. Proverbs fall from the saint's upturned bowl. Beneath the cypress, work is a steel gray word. Thought is plum and prayer a mournful green. A cube with three lacquered walls and a broken face holds them together. The almond merchant shuffles past the lake without humming. The singer hides his voice under a scarf. The guide won't admit to his compass. They're actors in a long-running movie about comets in which a pair of hands wash themselves at a fountain over and over, the soundtrack worn out, silence dripping from the stripped chinar and the charred roof to the headstones buried in snow. And now maybe a poem that is about words, about the, the claim that words make on you in mysterious ways just because they, they resonate, they are sounds that claim you in some way. This is called Checking the Toolkit and it's uh, dedicated actually to my German translator Jürgen Brockhan with whom I've had many discussions about words as they are, as they travel, as they take new forms. And we share an obsession with strange and archaic and lost words. This is in the poem. Checking the toolkit. You take things crafted by calloused hands and name them. With words that bruise the tongue, graze the eyes that speak coarse fabric, grease, metal fatigue, works rough edge, sting of varnish, knotted grain, curve, Stroud, adds, spigot. Spark these words against other words 
which damask the whispering tongue, caress the grazed eyes, naming beauty in syllables never moistened by sweat, words that pluck and carve, bodied by loom, quill, brush, brocade, palimpsest, persimmon, jade, and repeat as your words escape the prison of hands the reasoner's prayer, brocade, the eye following a meander between banks of raised thread of gold, kerf, a cut made by a saw in a piece of wood, a name for absence, stroud, persimmon, spigot, jade, hunters tracking buried words we ride a stream of clouded light, its slowness rivals the generations of cars that fly down the autobahn, hidden by plane trees, their sleepless tires foaming beneath our windows like an unseen ocean's tides. This one's slightly grim. Uses, <clears throat> uses for an executed dissident. The skin is miles long when stretched out flat. Flayed, you spread, your words invade every peninsula gnawed from the borders of the emperor's leached mind. Dead, you talk to more people than ever you did alive. The imprimatur of summer rain is stamped on this fertile skin that scrolls in all directions like the untellable story, slipping through checkpoints and barricades. Just think, a clever doctor could turn you into spiral-bound journals for children, or lampshades for people to wear as hats on dark nights going home from work. I'll close with, a, with what I imagine to be a prose poem, except that the definition of a prose poem is as variable as there are prose poems in the world. Because each time you approach this, this particular idiom, you take new liberties with it and find yourself able to do new things. But um, this is what it is. It's called Behizad Closes His Eyes. Um, Behizad is a figure that many of you will recognize from Pamuk's novels, but he has a, a visual pictorial reality in, uh, in the history of Safavid uh, painting. Behizad of Herat was the name he was known by. So this is, um, and at the end, the very last line has, uh, well not the very last, but near the end you will find certain words in Farsi, uh, which many of you will probably recognize as synonyms for red, well, different kinds of red. Behizad closes his eyes. He sits in the center of the carpet of silence, the last of all the carpets he will sit on, and calls out to the trees by their special names. Cedar was always good to him, wrapping its fragrance around his books. Cypress offered him the shelter of love. Pine shielded him from angry princes and jealous slaves. Poplar kisses his windows. Willow sweeps his river clean. Every autumn, Jenner has covered his garden with leaves like hands of flame. These he has trusted. But today they are quiet, respectful, distant. And his colors? He has fought them through the long dream of his life, powdered them in the mortar of his heart, glued them with anger. They have stung his sleeves and bitten his gold leaf borders. He has dragged them across marbled pages with his brush, forcing them into images. God made man from clots of blood. A painter makes saints from broken coral, grinds emperors from lapis. While other men sleep, he barters queens for turquoise. Spies bring him crushed cinnabar to finish his tented cities. Traders find him leopards and peacocks to draw. No cabinet is safe from his fingers. He will claw through the flasks and retorts of friends looking for the lost elixir. Who called him an idle collector of travelers' tales? He listens. He knows every shade will open in its own time.
tell its story in the fall of stained syllables. But Bezad has not listened to his colors for many years. He has forgotten the boy who beat off the swans and read the deepest pages of water. He has forgotten the young man who slashed through afternoon sawdust shrubs and the green silk pavilions of evening, the wolves howling in his blood. Too soon he came down from the mountains and chained himself to the forced march. An album for the king's uncle, a portrait for a merchant, love spells for a princess, the chamberlain's prayer book. To the beat of the sun's hooves, he herded his colors through the gates of floating palaces and honeycombed bazaars, splashed them on stairways left unfinished when the barbarians attacked, steps locked between earth and heaven. Hurrying north after the retreat, he dripped his colors on sketches that soldiers threw into winter fires, watching them shrivel into veils of ash. On this last carpet, he does not whip them with strokes of ink or trap them in porcelain cages. He knows the black angel is coming for him in a rain of sand, gardens and houses crumbling in its eyes. Nothing stands between Behzad and the angel except his colors. He draws his shawl around his shoulders. Once again the song of an, of an open wound. He chants their names. Lale, Kermes, Sekarlat, Khune Seavush. Dragon's blood blesses his page. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ranjit. I think he deserves a louder applause. <laughs> I want to formally thank you on behalf of the family with something that I know only a few people will appreciate. Well, um, a formal note of thanks, please bear with me. First, to Ranjit Hoskote. I know that, you know, Ranjit is one of the most celebrated poets of Indian English writing in India today. However, he was not our automatic choice for this year. The name came up from Professor Ram Ramaswamy, our Vice Chancellor. And I said, partly under my breath, we're going to do this every year. Ranjit is really young. Do we need to go for someone so young, so early? And here I have to say, <laughs> my vice chancellor said, Aparna, call him for a distinguished lecture and call him for the poetry. And then he started writing the email. So I must thank Professor Ramaswamy for making this possible. And I also want to thank Ranjit Hoskote, who of course was on our list, but as Sridhala knows, we keep putting the young ones off for, you know, yes. some time, the future. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Ranjit was really, really busy, and I must I'm say that I'm extremely grateful for being so patient with my rather persistent and continuous emails. And, you know, but one thing I should say, that he has been the first jury member in several years to come back with his top 10 and then his top 3 <coughs> at such breakneck speed. It was really fast. First there was an email saying, yes, the poems are here. And then I say, here's my list. And I thought there's something wrong with this. But it really, indeed, he sat up all night and read all those 175 <coughs> and came up with the list quite quickly. So thank you again. And uh, as I said earlier, Ranjani, thank you so much for traveling all over and making this possible. And I'm sure you'll win many more laurels. I must thank the Department of English who have been collaborating with the Srinivas Rai Pro Literary Trust since 2009. It was an automatic choice 
to collaborate with the Department of English, not just because I'm part of this university, but also because it is one of the premier departments in the country, and of course, in my father's city. Um, I would like to thank Professor Mohan Ramanan, who has been a jury member for the second time and a big support. And I know now that he's going to retire, he's going to be more and more involved with the trust and the family. Thank you, Professor Ramanan. Um, what can I say about Professor Sachidananda Mohati? Fourth time around, and he has been so approachable and so much advice. And of course, as department chair as well, he has been extremely sincere and committed to not only his department's interests, but to those of the trust and the prize. Thank you, Sachi, once again. Um, all the department chairs, right from Narayan Chandran, uh, who was heading the department when we handed over my father's books here, and they're taking very good care of them. And um, then we had Said Mujibuddin, <coughs> Shailaja, and Murli Manohar now, Pramod Nair, who was also there last year. So we thank you all very much. Um, these people have also served as jury members from the department, as well as others like Sridhar, M. Sridhar, and Sindhu Menon. Jury members representing the world of poetry in India have included Sudeep Sen, Jeet Tail, K. Srilata, Arundhati Subramaniam, Manohar Shakti, and now Ranjit Hoskote. We thank all these people. And we also thank the other poets and writers who have been very, very supportive to the trust and the prize. The late Meenakshi Mukherjee. And now we also thank Shiv K. Kumar, K. Kidaruwala, who has come to give away the prize, but promised to be a jury member as well. So we will take KK up on that. Of course, Hoshang Merchant, Adil Jusawala, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, who also had very, very nice things to say. Friends like Sridhala Swami, Shankar Melkote have been very supportive and we have always been turning to them. In the university, Usha Raman, Vasuki Belavati, and Bol Hyderabad, our public relations officer, Aship Jacob Thomas and his entire team have been very good. Ganesh of the SIP office has helped me collate all those entries year after year. And thanks to the staff of the Dean's Office of the Humanities, the Dean Professor Das Gupta, and you know, and all the staff who came today to make this Saturday evening a very, very successful event. I also want to thank our team, um, Srinivas, Gautami, and the others who are recording all this for us. And our family is grateful to the audience. There are about 25 people and they know who they are, and I cannot name them, who are coming year after year. And of course, so much part of the family, they don't need more thanks than that. But the rest of you are always new, and fresh faces are more than welcome, and we hope to see you again. If I've forgotten to thank anyone, it's because I've been emotional. But thank you all for making this event a very grand success. Thank you once again.